Hello and welcome to Season 2 of the MotoGP Extra Podcast. Yes, that's right, somehow we managed to actually finish an entire season. But I'm Reese, and joining me as always to discuss the events of the weekend is Dill. Now we've actually got quite a lot to talk about this time, because we've got the addition of the MotoGP Sprint and a very chaotic weekend overall, so we'll get straight into it with Moto3. And to be honest, it was a typical Moto3 race, wouldn't you say? Overall, you know, have you got any overall thoughts from the race? Obviously, it was the general Moto3 kind of battle that you'd expect, but I know you made some pretty good notes about it. So, have you got any sort of overall thoughts? It, from the race itself, from the first lap to the last corner, it was your standard Moto3 race, but it's funny how much the, cha- the, the class actually has changed because the top three men from last year, your champion, Eisen Guevara, has moved up, who was injured for Moto2. We'll cover him later. Fadja, last year's should have been champion for a lot of people. He moved up, and same with Sergio Garcia. So three big heavy hitters from the class gone. There's a little bit of inexperience in the field. There's only seven Grand Prix winners, I believe, in the class. So it's a much more... I, I, even though Moto3 is always the young rider, but you feel like it's every couple of years it has a little refresh, and at the moment we're going through one of those again. So a lot of new faces, a lot of new teams to get up to see it again. So good to be back, but it was really just your typical Moto3 race. Passes everywhere, riders all over the place, some really mad racing. But yeah, it was good to be back. Happy to see some Moto3 on track. Yeah, like you say, pretty pretty inexperienced field overall. Basically, just completely different people at the front. Obviously, there was Sasaki, and you know, obviously there was Munoz. There obviously was some like Masia, but generally it was like sort of younger rookie riders towards the front of the field because m- mainly all of the top guys are gone. Like you say, the top few in the championship from last year all disappeared because they've gone up to Moto Two or you know they've gone off to do other things like John McPhee, for example. You know, not saying he was particularly a top rider last year, but he's always been in the class for many years. He's now gone. So it is quite a changing of the guard, you could say, in Moto3. And I think that's going to give us a bit of a different sort of outcome over the course of the year. I think it will be quite interesting. But we'll get straight into some more specifics of the race then. Danny Holgado took his first ever victory. A pretty strong rookie season he had last year, but nothing that particularly indicated he would immediately start winning races at the start of this year. But uh, especially with him being technically demoted to the Tech 3 team. But he played the, he played the race fantastically, didn't he, really? He obviously took the lead, and he kind of led for most of the race. He dropped back a couple of times. But I don't know about you, but I think that's a really, really mature ride from something similar to what we saw, saw from Guevara like last year, you know, just playing the race perfectly. And for such a young rider, very, very phenomenal. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, did he not break his leg last year? I think he did, yeah. I think he did. Actually. I do remember him having issues last year with injury, missing a few races. But like you said, everyone sees that he gets demoted and instantly thinking, oh, well, he's probably not going to do anything. And I think he had a bit of fire in his belly and he came out trying to prove a point. And he really was good, in fairness to me. He had a, again, we go back to changing of the guard. He seemed to have a bit more in pocket in terms of race craft and knowledge of where to be. I was looking for Ayuma Sasaki throughout the race, thinking he's going to be the guy now that will probably pick up the pieces from everyone leaving and kind of he'll make a good start to season but in fairness it was Holgado who really played all his cards right and he really was deserving his victory and uh, had a small little incident when he crossed the line rolled off and unfortunately Joel Kelso went into the back of him I don't think there's any issue or injuries for Holgado but I do believe that Kelso went to the medical center and I actually don't know the result of that at the moment but uh, hopefully Joel was okay after it but it was a it was, it was just your standard rider comes across the line, he rolls off, starts celebrating, and Joel Kelso goes for a tear-off in what, what you probably would seem in normal position, but just the closing speed was a bit strange. I, I do like to hear your opinion on that one, because it, it was one of those things on the live feed, you just get a glance before they cut to another shot, and it was a bit of a helicopter crash looking from the, the onboard shot afterwards, so it wasn't nice to see, but hopefully Joel is uh, not any worse aware after that and should be back hopefully in Argentina because he actually did have some pace as well. Yeah, it was, a, it was a nasty crash, really, to be honest. I didn't actually catch it the first time, but then sort of as they went back to it and just showed him sort of lying there in the, in the pit lane exit, he ended up uh, with his bike all mangled on the side. Just strange incident. Holgado, to be honest, was pretty lucky to stay on just one of those things, like you say, that, that happens. Obviously, Holgado celebrating to, um, obviously, because he won the race. But I don't think he slowed down, like, a lot, really. Like, obviously, he did slow down quite a bit, but he didn't just suddenly slow down over the line. I think it was it was a bit careless from Kelso. But at the same time, I think he was trying to get a tear-off. 
and I think he was struggling to do it. So I think he turned his head to get a better grip on it. And that's a sort of when he was behind Holgado. But yeah, it's just one of those things. It's probably a bit of a lapse of judgment. Kind of reminds me of uh, Bastianini uh, at uh, Mugello 2021, I think it was, on the, the formation lap, just up towards the grid spots. Did he just ram somebody at the back and go straight over? Just one of those things. A little lapse of judgment can be super, super dangerous. Like you kind of think once the race is over, the danger's over, but it, it you know it can still happen. I seem to remember, I can't remember who it was now, but I think it was, I think it might have been Catalonia 2018. I think Oliveira got hit on the back by somebody. I can't remember who it was. It might have been, might have been like Corsi or somebody like that. I, you know, don't, you know, 100% quote me on that one, but I'm sure it was Oliveira that was struck by the rider. It might have been Manzi or somebody. I think, I think the other rider was Italian, but I, I could be wrong. But yeah, similar kind of incident there. It does just happen when some guy's celebrating, somebody else doesn't realize and, hits at the back fortunately well i was gonna say fortunately i don't actually know the outcome like yourself so uh, fortunately holgado is okay but i haven't heard anything about kelso you know probably one of those things where you know we haven't heard anything so he probably is okay you know probably just a bit winded i think he lost the visor to his helmet as well so it was quite a big one but yeah fortunately i think both riders have escaped with that one but a rider that really we did kind of expect to be one of the title favorites going into this year the promotion going the other way to Daniel Holgado, Dennis on chew. He had a pretty interesting race, didn't he? Had some sort of issue on the line, wasn't able to start, had to start from the pit lane. And what a phenomenal ride. We didn't see much of it, but a couple of more laps, he, he would have been in the lead group there. Yeah, it was, I remember seeing him starting off the pit lane. You just always see the riders go and then the Dornham and drops a flag and they're already, you're already watching the top 25 already gone through turn one. You're like, I could imagine just how, like, your heart would sink, thinking, geez, well, I was in such a good position. I was in the group, and now I have to get through everyone. I have to make up 8, 9, 10, 12 seconds just to get to the last place position. And uh, in fairness, it was one of those ones that went really quietly through the race. He worked through, and I think the last six, five, six laps, he was in the top 10. Fastest lap after fastest lap. And I think you are right, maybe two three more laps and i'd say he could have been prop- properly on the back of the grid and actually maybe challenging for the podium which is uh, something that we always think is amazing from a rider coming from the pit lane but it shows when they get some clear track at the start and they can get into the rhythm and then when they catch the group they kind of just carve through it like a hot night through butter and uh yeah he has a big season ahead of him so it wasn't a great start overall but he did really put in a good ride to recover so in fairness to him good shout out for Anju today he was a solid solid right after a small mishap at the start yeah maybe not the best result to start the season but i don't think it'll do him any harm i think he'll get a lot of confidence from it so yeah i think even though the points are not necessarily there i mean he's still finished in the top 10 so he still picked up okay points because i mean you can be leading going off the last lap and finish 10th in motor three so to be fair points not too bad Probably quite a confidence-boosting ride, so not a pretty good weekend there from Dennis Onchu altogether. And from one IO bike to the other, Rueda, the rookie, he had a pretty good ride, didn't he? Um, he was quite anonymous throughout. He was sort of just sat there in the top group, but for a rookie performance, it was it was very good because, again, you don't get that with the rookies. You know, you expect with the rookies, you expect a Munoz kind of ride where he's just dive bombing up the inside of everybody at every corner. But Rueda just kind of sat there in the pack, just kept his powder dry, and then right at the end, he, it looked like he was just going to get a podium, but sadly, he did just miss out. But, you know, you get a fourth place in your first Moto3 race after winning both the Rookies and Junior GP in the same year, the only rider to ever do that. You know, it, we've got a special talent on his hands here, and, you know, he could be an outside bet for the championship if we saw what Acosta did the other year. So, yeah, I, Rueda, I was uh, very impressed by him. Unfortunate not to get the podium, but it's going to be a matter of time. I'm sure he'll get one within a couple of rounds. Yeah, I feel like since Acosta's come into the class after coming up from the, the junior championships, I, I feel actually bad for some of them because a lot of them are deemed as failures now that if they don't come into the class and are like fighting for the win, fighting for the top five. It is out of this world how they can come up. It's uh, To be fair, it's a credit to Darna and the Rebel Rookies, the junior GP, that clearly the bikes aren't a million miles away because they're getting on it and they're already so quick that you must think that like the, the progressional path is 
quite strong now it has a good strong vein for them to come through and not get on like the, remember the old days when they went from motor three to motor two jesus they were lost for they could you could lose a ride over two years just because how how world apart they were but now coming through from red bull rookies or junior gp or wherever really they're coming from they are coming into motor three into the world championship level and they're well able and this guy jose antena rueda pretty mouthful of a name for me just another one of them and again like i said first to win two championship two previous championships in the same year so again another rider coming from a lower category breaking more records coming into his rookie race should have been on the podium it's just it's getting harder and harder to win these little categories they were never easy but riders coming through like this it is astonishingly competitive these days and it's just it's great for the viewer and you can just look at these guys and you just look i remember after more motor two i won't spoil it yet but acosta watching him thinking like i can't wait till he's on a big bike you just know he's going to win a world championship i can remember watching mark mark his in his day when he was back in the motor two class thinking you just know he's going to do well and uh, you get that feeling for some riders because uh, um eisen guevara last year was another one you just you get that feeling for me anyway already that he is going to go on for, for bigger and better things but great start one stuff in front of the other now and build on this and his rookie season will be one to remember i reckon yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. And you make a good point by saying about, you know, how they're deemed as failures now. If they don't come in and win straight away. You know, let's not forget some of the best riders we've ever seen. They were in the lower classes for a good few years. I mean, Mark Marquez, I think he was in the 125 class for three years. And then he won the title in his third year. Uh, Valentino Rossi won uh, the 125 championship in his second year. You know, Avrit Vinales was in Moto3 for two years. And I think he was in 125s for a year before that. So, you know, usually it's about three years for a lot of these guys. But... Now they're expected to perform immediately, so it is a, a lot of pressure on the young guys. And as well, also Rueda, it's even worth noting that, yes, he won both championships last year, and he was jumping from bike to bike because he had the Red Bull Rookies KTM bike, and his junior GP was on a Honda. So he show, he's already shown some adaptability in that aspect. So, you know, he's, he's already lined himself up for a proper future. And another rider that did that in Moto2. So moving to Moto2 now, we've got Pe- Pedro Acosta, Obviously, fantastic Moto3 season he had when he was in Moto3. A pretty good rookie season last year. I mean, compared to Ralph Fernandez, I guess you say the year before, not as good. But Acosta did get injured during last season. I think he would have been a shot, a shot at the championship had he not got an injury. But today, no one was touching him, was he? They, they were not getting anywhere near him. No, I I felt like when I was watching the Moto2 race, it was your typical Moto2 race. A couple of riders at the front. Gaps weren't growing. Maybe 80% of the track, uh, Costa had kind of covered pretty comfortably. And I reckon, even where Canet was quicker, I reckon it was just Acosta just being a little bit more wise on the tyre front of just thinking, well, this is a long on the edge of the corner, or on, on the edge of the tyre, I should say, corner. So he doesn't want to spin. And I reckon maybe Canet was just using a bit more tyre through that kind of final double corner to get to the line. And I think that's where he's making up all his time because... I think with about eight, nine laps to go, Acosta kind of, the commentators made a point of saying it looks like he's figured it out. I don't think he figured it out. I think he just decided to go then because his pace was just that good. I felt like Canet was just hanging on to him and Canet was doing so well to stick with him because Acosta looked so good on that bike. And he's definitely, definitely going to win a lot of races this year and it's going to be hard for anyone to put a glove on him. He was just so calm today. Even with Canet just a second behind him, no mistakes. Brilliant ride from him. I can't have a, I don't have enough imperatives for Acosta. He just really was top notch today. And I think this is could be his more two season. A lot of people tipped him last year to come up and wipe the floor with everyone. Not easy to do when you're going on to a different machine completely. He's had a year out of it. He's had a very, very impressive preseason. And race one, tick, on to the next one for Acosta. Yeah, I think he's going to wipe the floor with them this year, to be honest. He doesn't look like anyone's in his league. Like you say, of course, Canet did do a great job today, and probably we'll talk about Canet in a minute. But I think Acosta kind of had him covered. I think Acosta could have probably put more time into Canet had he wanted to. But I think he just thought, just keep him at, you know, sort of between half a second and a second back from him. And, you know, nothing too bad there. And he wasn't overstressing his tyre, like you say. I think Canet was uh, using his tyre up a bit more because by the end, Acosta seemed to have a little bit more but we may as well talk about can it whilst we're talking about the leading two a great ride from him but unfortunately still not breaking that wind duck and it is one of those things where it's just going to keep piling on him when he's not won a race he's going to be so desperate to win a race 
to be fair, this is probably one of the better rides from him because I think had obviously Acosta not been there, he would have been a dominant victor in this race. It's not like uh, you know he, he was struggling or anything. He looked like he was he looked pretty good up there at the front. It wasn't like Acosta was miles faster. Acosta obviously was a fair bit quicker. I, I think I think he was holding back a bit, but it wasn't like you know Canet was just about keeping on to him. Canet, you know, he, he was legitimately there. He was probably using a bit more tire, but you know he had good pace himself. So. Yeah, I think Canet's probably started off a season in a good stead, but yeah, still unfortunate for him to not have won a race yet. Yeah, I feel like Canet is just missing one or two percent to get that victory. And to be honest, last year he made a lot of mistakes in good positions. And I thought, well, like riding like this, you're not going to do it. And when I saw him today, I was I was really impressed with his pace, and I really was happy that he was able to go with Acosta. But I still knew in the back of my head that barring a shock mistake or a shock part of the race to intervene with it, really Acosta had him covered and like last year he had a car crash, he was having bloody noses while he was on track, there was a couple of races where he was under the weather so not a great season last year off track from so his results did kind of show it and I think the pressure of the first race when he's getting but I think he must have had a good pre-season and a good off season because he looks well, he looked good on the bike, and like you said, take a cost out of that when he wins that hands down pretty comfortably. And I can comfortably say that I reckon he will get a win this year. I reckon it, it will fall into place this year because he's had another year with that team now. Calix look like they've made a small step forward, so hopefully he can uh, just tie up a few loose ends. And I reckon there will be a weekend or two this year where it all just falls into place. I do imagine he would win this year at least one race, even with a cost in the class. Yeah, I'd be I'd be surprised if he didn't end up winning one, but it's just the case of, you know, does he end up cracking under the pressure what's leading and crashing or something like that? I think he'll have the pace one weekend to win. I mean, he showed last year that, you know, given the right circumstances, I think he probably could win. And uh, this year, you know, he showed a very good race today. I think there'll, there'll be a weekend where maybe Acosta's not quite as on it. And, you know, he needs to find half a second over like 20 odd laps. So, you know, I think Canet is uh, definitely going to get a win at some point this season. But from one set of title contenders to someone that we expected to be in the title chase, Alonso Lopez, obviously pretty much the this outstanding rider of last season. You know, he came in late, replacing Fanati. No one really expected a lot from him, but he was absolutely phenomenal, picking up a couple of race wins, being up there every weekend. You know, had he been there from the beginning of the season, if he'd had that performance throughout the season, he would have been a championship contender. You know, he was no worse than any of the riders that were fighting for the championship in terms of both pace and consistency. But... Not a great weekend for him or his teammate either, to be honest. Fermin Aldeguer, uh, Lopez, of course, having the crash. Uh, well, yeah, did he crash in the end? I think he did crash out. He did crash out, yes, in the penultimate corner, that downhill right-hander. Yeah, and then, of course, he had the incident earlier on where he yep. took the long lap penalty. And there was also some sort of incident on the first lap as well where his teammate about high-sided in front of him and he hit him <laughs> on the back. So that one wasn't his fault, to be fair, of course. You know, that wasn't obviously down to him, but... Yeah, a bit of a scrappy weekend, just not quite looking comfortable all weekend. So, you know, maybe it's down to the Bosco Scuro, but yeah, what did you make of uh, Alonso's weekend? I had some question marks over Alonso Lopez coming into the season for... I have just theory where he came into the paddock last year, nobody expected him to come. He wasn't coming in like an Acosta where everyone was banging the door about him. People were saying he was very good. He came up from like Spanish Championship Motor 2. He was replacing Fanati. There was a lot more noise about Fanati's unlawful sacking than there was about the potential of Lopez coming in. And I think he went in under the radar, overperformed in my opinion, got better results, got on a bit of a wave and had a great second half of the season, whatever, how long he was there for. Now, if you're performing slightly above your ceiling, it is so hard to make a step in a in an off season to go again, so I reckon he's just maybe struggling a small bit. I have seen it before in years gone by in the Motor Two class where a rider is just a performing. I remember when Xavi Verhe was back in the Tech Three, he was massively overperforming that bike. He was putting the bike places it shouldn't be, and then eventually he got on a different bike, and it just didn't look the same from it. Didn't come as easy. Couldn't get on with the bike, and just didn't really work for him. I feel like I know now. Uh, Alonso has not changed team but I feel like everyone this year was expecting it from him and he, they expect more that he's going to push on to be a championship front runner and a championship contender against the likes of Acosta and Ayagora but I feel like now the pressure's on him and that, that's kind of what we saw today a couple of mistakes a crash pretty much nowhere all weekend but I, I do think it is 
uh, worth mentioning that it looks like Calix has made a step over the offseason away from Bosco Scora. So maybe certain races this year we'll see what we saw last year from Lopez. Like the old days where you had speed up and Calix where speed up would be the bike to be on for three out of 18 rounds of the year. So it'll be interesting to see how he deals with this because since he's got to the Grand Prix circuit so far of the World Championship level, everything's kind of gone his way for the most part so now his first big bit of a uh, big mountain to climb over we'll see how he gets on but he was a uh, quick in ever he went last year so i'd imagine that he should bounce back to some extent in argentina yeah hopefully because it's nice to see you know a different manufacturer up there because no offense i don't see the forward racing bike winning or running a race this year unless it's wet so uh yeah i think it'd be nice to see the bosco scuro boys up there a bit more at the next race. To be honest, remember, Adeguer was on pole at Argentina, so, it, you know, could uh, last year it could very well be that the Bosco Scuro works a bit better at that circuit. Now, before we move on to MotoGP, do, do want to just give a little shout-out to Darren Binder making his Moto2 debut this weekend, and I think we did a similar shout-out to him for the first race of last year as well. <laughs> um, but he was surprisingly good. He was looking good. He was running in the top eight. Unfortunately, he did have a little crash, but to be honest, jumping into Moto2 isn't easy now i think probably jumping from moto gp to moto 2 is probably slightly easier than jumping from moto 3 to moto 2 but even still a top 10 on your debut in a class i know of course he did fall off but i think he probably would have stayed there had he just finished those last couple of laps so to be in that position throughout the whole race i think it's pretty impressive from darren bender yeah and in, in fairness and like all weekend he was around 12th to 10th that area so he he showed that he has the pace to be there but the one thing that really impressed me and it doesn't really surprise me just because of his riding style when he crashed he dropped back to i believe 21st and three laps later he's back in like p16 he had like a damaged bike obviously just after making his first big mistake of the season and he jumps back on and just starts overtaking people again so i reckon he has pretty good feel that bike his that livery on that Calyx is so good looking and his like South African helmet it, yes, it's, right. just, it's just one of the tidiest liveries on the, the GP paddock this year for me I really do like it and uh, I really really was happy with him because he was battling like Sam Lowe's Dixon around riders that are a lot more experienced than he is in this class and for his debut I know small tip off turn 5 is just a terrible corner for that it's so easily done We've seen so many riders do that over the weekend, so I wouldn't hold it against him. I look forward to his season actually, because I feel like he's been dragged through the uh, dragged through the washing machine over the last kind of eighteen months to two years, with getting dragged from Moto Three contract reasons into GP, basically, but not given a chance. Probably doing better than majority of people could have done going from Moto Three to GP, and then kind of being shafted with Yamaha, RNF, Aprilia, and all that going out the window. So. I actually rate him a lot more now after seeing him like this. I was quite surprised at his pace. I did expect him top 15, but in the top 10, that consistently, and he looked good. So roll on the next couple of races. I'm really intrigued, and I'll be keeping a keen eye on him. Yeah, I think it, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on him, especially at some of the tracks where he goes quite well. I think he's quite good at Haref. I think I seem to remember him in Moto3 he was always pretty good at Haref. So yeah, Big up Haref. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we know how much you love Haref, don't yeah. we? <laughs> I'll have the Darren so, yeah. Binder flags out then that week. Yeah. Yeah. The DB15 flags. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to MotoGP now. And of course, going into this, we have a very serious topic to talk about. And of course, that was the crash on Friday for Paulo Spagaro. You know, a nasty crash. Obviously, we're not 100% sure of his condition, to be honest. You know, we know some of the, the injuries he sustained, the broken jaw. So he's had a lot of chest trauma, some vertebrae problems. And, you know, they're not even able to identify all that because of swelling. So... Of course, we really, really wish Paul the very best and hopefully he is fighting fit as soon as possible. But that was obviously a horrible way to start the weekend and the season. Uh, some things had to change as well with the uh, the air fence was then installed after that crash. Very strange incident, wasn't it? It was uh, not actually that big of a crash initially, but then it seems to be an impact from the bike that's caused all that, the damage to Paul. But yeah, I don't know if you saw the incident when it actually happened initially, but it was uh, it was a very strange one. Yeah, it, it's kind of an innocuous crash that just got worse and worse. And it is worth pointing out that in the rider safety briefings that Portimao has come under a lot of flack in testing. If we go back to the couple of days test at Portimao before the start of the season, 
lots of riders, majority of riders complained about the size of the rocks in the, the gravel, that they were just too big and that not they weren't basically if if you think of a sand trap, the old sand traps, sand obviously being grainy and stuff like that, it's very soft, but it's very compact, so it has a lot of friction to it, but moves around quite nicely. But if you go in there on the bike, the chance of you crashing or getting beach stairs high, that's why most tracks don't have a for Formula One, and that's why we have these runoffs. Now, gravel is supposed to do the same thing. It's supposed to be a bit more uh, for easier for Marcel to get the bike out of the way quicker, for riders to slow down. But you can have tracks where they're more like pebbles and rocks, and then you're getting into a completely different situation because riders are being barrel rolled a lot more aggressively. Back to Paul's crash. He goes over the top, lands, the bike follows him, he gets thrown massively around in the gravel, and then as he goes towards what would be the tire wall, it does no clear angle of what's happened, but it looks like he's gotten a smack from the bike. Now, his injuries at the moment, like we said, the broken jaw, uh, a, a lot of contusion around the chest and back area. Contusion is basically a fancy word for bruising. I did a bit of Googling to exactly find out what it was. It's, it's just like a medical term for bruising. So bruising and swelling around the chest. So a lot of his injuries aren't that bad but they're quite bad in terms of bruising and just being sore all over and now of course the broken jaw is not good and there might be a few chips to a vertebrae and stuff like that but at the moment he's going back to barcelona to get surgery but they need to wait a couple of days for the swelling to go down on his jaw before they can operate they also reckon there could be more fractures after some swelling goes down so unfortunately for paul it will be probably another two or three race weekends before we see him again it's a uh, terrible really but for me, a big thing is the Portimao track. It's not good enough safety-wise. Um, people love watching it. It's such a entertaining track for the riders to ride and watching these magic magical machines going round and round in it. But when it comes to safety, you have to get that done right. And after the test, everyone complained about the gravel. Apparently, they were going to fix it. And apparently, they did make it slightly better. But it looks like only a half ass job maybe um, I might be speaking out of turn there but definitely wasn't right come FP1 and FP2 for GP so unfortunately another little black X next to Portimao for that but hopefully he'll be back stronger than ever soon rather than later but uh, we wish him well yes we, we do indeed and you make a good point mentioning the safety of the track itself because obviously if you remember a couple of years ago there was the uh, the pretty big crash for Jorge Martin you know, he did a lot of damage to himself and he was out for quite a while. And I, I don't know, again, if that was down to the gravel to some extent. So, yeah, it's not the first time that we've had an issue with the Portimao, you know, the, the track, the, the facilities around the, the track. So, yeah, hopefully they can try to sort that out as soon as possible for when we get here next year. Obviously, they're going to have a whole year, probably a little bit more to fix it because I don't think it's going to be round one next year. So, yeah, they've, they've got plenty of time to fix it, but it definitely needs sorting out before we do come again. But of course, with it being the first round of 2023, first round of the new weekend format, the first round of the sprint. So we'll talk about the sprint first before we get into the main race. And the note that I have here is absolute chaos. I mean, it was crazy. It was like a Moto3 race, but even more so. Like there was dive bombs coming everywhere, different people crashing, you know, quite a few different things. There was a bit of flack then from some of the riders, some of the fans saying, you know, that it was obviously quite dangerous but then on the other hand there was some people really you know loving it. it was a was a was a cracking race to be fair there was some proper good battling in there as well but uh what did you make of that first sprint because i thought overall the race was good but uh, you know I, I didn't like to see the amount of crashes that were, that were happening in there of course i was a bit anxious and nervous coming into it because i did get the impression that your likes of your marcus is and people that had one for a better phrase nothing to lose coming into it that they knew that the long race did struggle and well, again the long race. <laughs> yeah we, we, we we cover. Later, exactly um, but previous um, we've seen this in Superbikes we've seen this in F1 but it plays a part to the grid in race 2 or the main race in some uh, some disciplines but the fact that GP have brought in as a separate just kind of piss around on a Saturday afternoon means that you can kind of just take the piss in the race. You can kind of just send it and hope for the best. And I don't really like the attitude. They're already crazy enough. They're already on their limits enough. I don't really like the fact that there were so many aggressive moves. There was too many incidents. There was too many riders complaining. We, me and Reese joked about how it being like an online video, like uh, like GP Bikes Online, where so many accidents, so many people giving out about other people's riding. There was just car 
chaos everywhere, like you said at the start. So, I did enjoy it, but I'm still kind of on the fence whether it's good for the sport because one i do not like the new schedule from a viewer it's a lot more time consuming if you do want to watch the sprint race it's later in the day than the qualifying finish so it's going to be saturday you're going to be watching it till later there's just a, it's a bit messy at the moment for my liking um no i am a traditionalist i always loved qualifying saturday race on sunday so maybe it's a bit of that coming into it but the fact that the day goes on a bit long for my liking i might be altered in the future maybe the first one again now the first race is always going to be kind of a, a learning experience even for Dorna themselves but the racing was fantastic it was just a bit chaotic and probably over the line from some riders yeah i think that's probably a bit of an understatement that it was <laughs> slightly over the line for some of the moves that were going on like you say it was it was pretty much a gp bikes lobby there was yeah i'm pretty sure that may that move that may pulled i've had that happen to me in gp bikes <laughs> just uh bit ridiculous we might as well actually talk about that move um obviously fabio quattarara didn't get off to the best start he didn't qualify that well either jar may got a lot to prove on his honda debut and to be honest i don't really have anything to say other than what was he actually even trying to do like he literally was just trying to ride through fabio in that corner um it was the the tricky sort of left hander uh just before the penultimate turn we've seen some moves go wrong there before i think uh i think miguel miguel got corner. yeah miguel in the corner yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of other ones as well, but that's the first one that jumps to mind for me. But yeah, I just don't know what Joan was even trying to do. It just there was no gap. He just sent it at the inside, just knocked himself off, punted Fabio off, sent uh, his airbag off, and then just picked up a long lap penalty himself for the race. So not a great way to uh, start off in Repsol colours. And just I just don't know what he was even thinking. Yeah, it was it was it was it not a double long lap penalty? Yeah, actually, yeah, it might have been a double long lap. The, we get to shoots in a minute. It's, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, we we'll get, get double long laps for some crashes and just single for others. Yeah, so we're, while we're talking about the stewards, they've been pulling penalties out of a, a out of a half reading, drawing them out randomly because identical crashes in different races and there's different penalties. But we're, we'll give them the first round new sprint race, all that. We'll give them benefit of doubt for this one, but we'll have a whole. Got uh, a double long. Yeah. Long three and then the same incident Lopez got uh, was a single yeah so, so yeah just... figure that out but for round one like we said we're going to give him a bit of leeway but if we have more of this in round two we will have our own Stewart's Corner debate again like we did for probably the first 13 rounds of last year That's part of the podcast it was yeah it was probably about the only people listened to enjoy it was us moaning about the, pod, the, the poor officialing every week but back to the mere incident for me, I try to th- think of a racer's mindset, and I think he just tries to send it and hope for the best and hope that, one, Fabio sees him early, and two, he kind of picks up because he thinks he has more to lose than Mir. But he got it ter- terribly wrong, really, and um, does not does not have great outside shot for it, to be honest. There's ones from different angles. You see it from a weird long shot, and then the onboard. The onboards are always hard to see because you can't really see exactly where the rider and the bike are. So from what it looks like, Fabio is pretty much on the line. There's not really any deviation from him. He's not wide. He's not deep. He's not going for some overtake on someone else. And it does very much look like that mirrors on the inside curb, which is always the <laughs> giveaway that you're doing something wrong. Yeah. So uh, penalty was deserved. Um, Alberto Puge came out saying it was a ridiculous penalty. Um no doubt if Mir was the one taken up by Fabio, he'd be having kittens about how it was probably the worst movie you've ever seen in his life. So typical Alberto just being a seesaw of emotions when it comes to his team. So Everything he says it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> literally. But um, unfortunately for Mir, not a great start to the sprint for him. And it kind of did affect his main race after the penalty. Yeah, I mean, if you get a double long lap penalty, it, uh, it does affect your race. To be fair, Portimao would probably be the track where you, one of the tracks where you wouldn't mind it so much because it's actually not too bad. But it looked like it was not very grippy out there. Mm, like, lots of bumps it, as well. It's not really used aside from MotoGP. Like you know, don't, you don't get long lap penalties in F1. You don't get long lap penalties in GT racing and all this other stuff that happens in Portimao. So yeah, I uh, imagine the long lap's not used that much, but. We may as well talk about the other main incident of the race, obviously the crash. Unfortunate, really. This one, not exactly going to be harsh on the uh, the rider that caused the incident. So obviously, Luca Marini crashed and unfortunately collected his Ducati colleague, Enea Bastianini. And 
I think it's fair to say that's Vashley in his championship over, right? Um, he broke his shoulder. He's gonna. He had to miss the main race today, and he's gonna have to miss Argentina at least. Whether he's then gonna, you know, have to miss USA as well. I don't know. It seems like he probably is targeting a comeback there, but you know, it was just one of those things. Unfortunately, up the inside, Marini just folds to the front at turn five, and his bike just clatters into Bastianini, and he went down so hard on his shoulder. I really do feel for an air because I bet that proper hurt really. Uh, just looked like a really uncomfortable sort of incident. You know those crashes where you just they just look horrendous. It was certainly one of those. I don't think that's really the fault of aggression because you know Marini's not the type to do anything aggressive anyway, uh, like sillily aggressive. So quite unfortunate, but obviously probably the second biggest, well maybe even just the biggest talking point of the sprint. To be fair, that yeah, and like you said, the broken shoulder, but he's actually also broken. I believe it's called scalphoid, which is in your wrist, and that is known. As Cal Crutcher, for example, you have basically three bones in there. The further bones, so the ones that are further in, get less blood flow. They are career-ending injuries. Now, nobody's mentioning this out there yet, but this could... Like, we are pretty much ruling him out of the season because he lost 37 points this weekend. He's going to lose another 37 next weekend in Argentina. He probably will try and ride in Texas, but Texas is... A motocross track really for GP it is ridiculously bumpy uh, they did try and fix it not really great when you've IndyCar Formula 1 NASCAR it's never going to be a great track really overall for bikes with it being ripped up so much it's also being built on a bog which is brilliant planning so that track is going to constantly be going up and down and moving and have ripples so that track will never be a smooth track never mind the layout it is incredibly physical so would you be wanting to come back onto Ducati with a broken wrist and a broken shoulder? Maybe. If not a threat, and that's that's 104 points he's lost there. 114 maybe, if my maths is correct. So you're already really out of the championship. The way Bagnaia started uh, sprint race and full race, you're going to need to stay fit this year. So many races, you're going to be needing like a mere season where you get to the flag, you get to the flag, you get to the flag. That is the objective for this season. Everyone's going to make mistakes. A lot of riders are going to get caught up in these incidents in sprint races. We see what happens when you don't qualify well. So, unfortunately for Bastianini, end of a season, I just hope that the injury doesn't prolong his Ducati career in any other ways. I hope that it's a open and showcase, nice, simple recovery, and that kind of puts the start behind him comes back in either Austin or Horeth and then just builds the rest of the season gets up to speed in a factory team and uh, it's a shame to be saying already that I'm looking for him looking forward to seeing him in 24 but I, I do really see that his season is, is off to the worst possible start because I don't see any other way of him coming back unless his other rivals get injured just like him which I, I really hope that doesn't happen but yeah poor Bastianini yeah I th- yeah it's just not great, and I shouldn't even really thought about it the way that you said. I didn't know he'd uh, done the scaphoid as well. Was that is a terrible little bone because yeah, the blood flow is not great to it, so it doesn't grow back very well. And really, you don't want to be having a career-ending injury. Obviously, you don't wish that on anybody. And uh, I was just thinking of his actual current season, but yeah, into entire his entire career and shoulder injuries as well, which obviously is also damaged. We've seen with Mark Marquez how bad they can be. So you know, hope I'm hoping the best for Bastianini, and hopefully he can be back as soon as possible, but I think it is safe to say that his, uh, his season is pretty much over there. But speaking of Mark Marquez, obviously just mentioned him with his injuries, he had a very good sprint race, uh, so we'll come on to his main race later, but his sprint race, is well, his qualifying for a start, we may as well cover that. How did he get pole position? I mean, that bike has been nowhere all throughout pre-season. They've been saying the bike's not good enough, it's terrible. You know, Mir then ends up getting second place in uh, the free practice session, but then in the actual free practice two, and then, well, actually it's called, it's called practice now, isn't it? So in the first practice session, Mir was second, then in F, uh, regular practice two, he was nowhere, and then come qualifying, Marquez was the only one that qualified anywhere, and he managed to put it on pole, which, you know, again, just Mark Marquez magic. And then in the race, played it pretty well. He tried, he tried a bit for the win, but the two Ducatis were just too quick, and he basically just battled a bit with Miller and with uh, Oliveira, and a great bit of opportunism to actually get past the pair of them. Oliveira got back in front, but then, of course, made his mistake. And Marquez being, you know, obviously one of the older riders on the grid now, actually keeping his head a little bit and picking up a result that really 
his bike did not deserve his bike did not deserve to feel the podium but uh yeah it was it was a great sprint race and qualifying from marquez well mark marquez <laughs> yeah and in terms of the, the free practice practice debate it'll always be free practice me i'm going to continue calling free practice because one i'm not going to change when it comes to this um i still call the speed up this is now the third session that's it's, 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 yeah but it'll i'll I'm telling you this. Oh, no it's free practice one free practice two free practice three it'll always be free practice it's been free practice for as long as the cows have gone home so for me it'll always stay but anyway with marquez it probably is his first show that he is actually fully back and fit that he was able to do these sort of magical moments of not only getting through q1 because he did crash on Friday in free practice too behind Fabio, I believe it was, trying to get a, a toe. And he did a lap in f- Q1, and then he kind of came in and goes, yeah, I'm not wasting another tyre. I'm probably not going to beat that lap time. He followed his teammates. Unfortunately, Mir didn't get through. And then came into Q2, went out on his own. He didn't really had another lap in the session, really, because I, I was keeping an eye on him to see really just where the Honda level was. And with a minute and a half to go, he was 10th with some pretty slow average speed lap. And he was on a lap, makes a mistake in turn 7, runs wide, falls in behind Bastianini, and then does probably one of his best laps ever and just absolutely... They follow most of the lap from the, the live directory and it was just sideways ever, drifting up and over all the crests and putting it down. And he was just catching and gaining a Bastianini everywhere and it was... It was one hairline fracture of a mistake away from a terrible crash, but he managed to keep it in line and keep everything just on above board for the lap, and it was magnificent. But when we got to the sprint race, everyone was going to say he's going to go backwards, he's not going to be able to stick with it, and in fairness, in the sprint race, he overperformed again. So when you think of his actual main race, it's not a surprise that it eventually all fell apart from him, but... Yeah. Yeah, his uh, his sprint race was pretty magical because the fact that he got away with the fast boys, managed to stick with them for a few laps, then dropped back, got passed by a few people, but then managed to come back again. So he obviously managed to pull it out of fire again and to get the podium. Even though it's a shortened race, it's nothing, nothing short of astonishing for Mark. Yeah, it, it really was. I mean, obviously, like you say, we're, uh, we're alluding to what happened later on. We'll talk about that in a bit. But from him... It was a fantastic performance. And also from Jack Miller as well, who we'll talk about now. Because, you know, you can almost compare the two. KTM have been nowhere in uh, pre-season. They look like they've been in trouble. You know, Miller kind of initially got up to speed pretty quickly on the KTM, but then never really got any quicker. But then all of a sudden he tops the first free practice session out of absolutely no... Uh, second free practice session. Yeah, I've called it free practice again. But <laughs> I'm just going to roll with it. It's, like you say, it's just it just stuck in your head, isn't it? it I don't know why they've changed the name. It's, it's just confusing, but whatever. Miller topped a session at this track called Portimao uh, somehow. <laughs> and then obviously he did a great job in qualifying as well. Looked very briefly like he could be on pole as well, which would have been unbelievable. Obviously not quite been able to do that, but a great qualifying position because the KTM's not exactly known for qualifying. And I think now it's probably fair to say that maybe it's not the bike's problem. Perhaps they've just never had riders that are that great at qualifying on the bike because obviously his first weekend on it, he qualifies it pretty highly up. You know, probably higher than Binder has ever put it. To be honest, I don't, actually, I don't think Binder's ever been on a front row, has he? I think his highest must be about like sixth or something, fifth or sixth, so... Yeah, pr- pretty much matching whatever Brad Bender's ever done in qualifying. So that's the thin area he needs to try and improve. But qualified the bike great, led the sprint race for a bit. I mean, he, he was pulling some pretty good passes up the inside of Banyar, up the inside of Martin, leading very briefly, dropped back a bit. Bit of a battle with Oliveira and Marquez, of course, like we mentioned before. But honestly, I'll, I'll 100% admit, I didn't expect much from him, to be honest. I thought, right, his career peaked at the Ducati. You know, he got a few wins in his last season. That's lovely. That'll be his uh, last win unless there's some crazy wet race. But to be honest, after that, you know, the right conditions at a dry race, he could even win. So, you know, fair play to Miller. I'll take my hat off to him because he's outperformed what I expected him and the bike to do, even in that first round of the season. Yeah, and I was actually a big fan of Miller at Ducati. And when he went to KTM, I was kind of in the same boat where I was like, nah, it's kind of a career-ending move for him because not only is he... He, he was never a prolific winner with Ducati, which was the best bike in the grid. Um, crashed one or two times too many out of big races for me for 
a real championship push, moving to a KTM team that have been after him since 2015. Um, it's pretty pretty impressive that he's managed to do this early on. Um, for me, I, I'm going to burst a lot of people's bubbles. It's down to the fact they've had three days testing on that track. I reckon Deloni, I don't think either of them will be in Q2 in Argentina. I reckon that they will struggle that much because you give a team of that much like you give a team that much time on track with that bike in pretty decent conditions the whole time. Maybe today and Saturday was a bit windy, but overall the track is rubbered in, it's dry, it's pretty similar temperatures, it's not wet or anything, so they'll eventually start to figure out, oh, well, okay, well, our engine mapping here is really poor, we really need to fix this against this bike, and eventually all the pieces come together, and in fairness, he stuck on soft tyres, and he really pushed for the 10, 12 laps, and managed to pull it out and get a great result, but I feel like when we get into the the actual season start, when we get, I know, no, we're not going back to Europe as we're already here, but when we go away and come back to Europe, we will see the KTM probably maybe every second, third race getting one rider into Q2 and then probably the two of them finishing nicely in the top 10 again each week. But I don't think that they're going to kick on from here. I think this is probably a good chance they peak. If you look at back at KTM last year getting podium in the first race, they kind of peaked there. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised today getting, was it fifth and sixth they got in the, the race with Miller and Binder. Um, I'd be pretty pretty much surprised if they get anywhere better than that to two of them this season, really. Yeah, that's fair. The point you make about the testing. I mean, it is KTM. They've probably got the biggest budget out of all the factories. You know, they've yeah. got probably some of the best sort of engineers in terms of like looking at the data and trying to fix the problem. So yeah, I mean, if you've got like a whole week of running at the same track, I suppose they're gonna you know get to grips in the end. It's probably why the sprint race was the way it was because everybody was on the limit and they were. I mean, even in the long race, but even more so in the sprint race, just, they were all on the limits. That's probably why, you know, we, we had so many sort of crazy moves because everyone was already so, you know, far past what they could do, really. And then we're trying even harder and it just resulted in some chaos. So maybe we'll have a bit more normality. Uh, but then, you know, Argentina and Texas are always a bit crazy anyway. So, yeah, perhaps we'll have a bit more normality come Jerez. So, as, as we always say every year, as everybody that covers MotoGP always says, oh yeah, we'll know by like Jerez, so you have to wait yeah. until like round five <laughs> to yeah. actually know what's going to happen in the championship quarter of the way through uh, because there'll be, you know, two races per round, so you'll have plenty of races before you know what's actually going to happen. But, he, but either way, Pekka Banyaya picked up where he left off in 2022. Obviously, if you forget Valencia, of course, wasn't a great weekend for him, but uh, winning the championship in a very dominant fashion Obviously, you know, he did only just win it by a few points in the end, but the amount of wins he had, the pace he had over the season, he was clearly the dominant rider. And in the sprint race, and of course in the, the main race as well, but we'll talk about that in a little bit, just picked away left off. Great race from him, really. Um, obviously, he didn't panic, even in a short race. you think you'd panic if you were falling back a little bit, but he lost a couple of positions, you know, dropped behind Martin, dropped behind Miller. Didn't panic at all. You know, Miller, he let Miller lead for a bit. Obviously, Miller then sort of started to drop back. Closed up to the back of Martin. In fairness, you know, Martin, of course, made a mistake. I think he just struggled to actually pull an overtake on him. But again, he was the one that put Martin under that pressure and who ran wide. So, and he clearly looked after his tyre a little bit better than Martin did. So, fair play to Banyaya. Again, you know, it's one of those things where the race is a good example to add it, but he just played his cards right. Again, just proving that, I mean, yeah, all right, he's on the best bike on the Ducati, but he's clearly the best rider on the Ducati as well. So you can't retake really anything away from the guy. Yeah, he, he's a bit more of a Valentino about him this year, I feel. I feel like that championship, the big number one, he has that inner belief that Valentino had from a very young age. And I think being around Valentino for so many years, it's rubbing off him now because he just looks like an absolute killer on that bike. Um, obviously made a mistake on Saturday, a small tip-off at the end of free practice three. Didn't really dent his confidence at all. Um, pretty much was faultless. In the two races, obviously talking about the sprint race, stayed calm. It's a very good point that you would say that in a sprint race, even more so if you go backwards, you might get a bit tight or you might start pushing over the limit and crash. But no, he kind of let it happen. Had still plenty of time in that race, and uh, picked off Miller, picked off a mistake from Martin, and just rode to the line. 
didn't look like he broke a sweat. He looks very calm. He's had a brilliant preseason. Ducati have done a brilliant job at just ironing out some issues with Peko, ironing out some issues with the bike. They've just married them together. Really, really strong bond. And it's going to be a hell of a season for Peko. I could see him winning a lot of these races because he's he's usually very quick out of the blocks. He's not one of those riders that takes eight, nine laps to get up to speed. Uh, his teammate will be one of those riders that kind of comes into the race late. Peko is one of those riders that likes to get a start, get into turn one first and kind of lead the pack. And he's quite good at it. And I guarantee there will be sprint races this year where he will pull three seconds in the first two laps and that will be him done after 10 laps winner. So for me, Peko is... Last year, I put him as my championship favourite. I kind of got lucky because he made so many mistakes... The Yamaha made so many mistakes with Fabio that he eventually kind of fell across the line. But this year, I'm kind of have full confidence that Peko is the man to beat. And after seeing his two races and the sprint race in Portimao, I'm not really, I've no different opinion from that really right now. Yeah, got to say, I agree. Uh, just going into this, he, he looks like a complete package now, almost from that. Obviously, you know, it's, he does probably still have a mistake in him. We haven't seen, you know, whether he's been pushed to that level yet, but. You know, in the past, I think we perhaps could have seen him crash or try too hard and ran wide or something. You know, tr- trying to get back through, but he didn't. T- that number one clearly not affecting him because I remember I said on the one of the preseason podcasts we did that perhaps maybe he'd feel the pressure of that number one. Clearly, clearly, it's not. Um, you know, he just probably gives him more confidence. To be honest, it probably works the other way because he just seems. You know, he's just just his old demeanor. He just seems so much better. You know, he knows now he's the you know he's the best rider in the world. He can, you know, he can beat all these people. And I think sometimes having that in your mind just makes it even easier for you. So that obviously helped him out in the uh, the main race as well, which we'll get on to right now. But we've alluded to the Mark Marquez incident a few times in the main race. It's probably the biggest thing that came from the main race. So we'll, we will just cover it um, at first. Just obviously, it was a. Uh, Pretty bad looking accident. Now, actually, I think it goes back to lap one where Marquez going into turn three. He sort of came from quite far back. It's very strange. He almost sort of locked the front, the front sort of bottomed out. He had to release the brake. He dived at the inside of everybody, was, was briefly in the lead because of that, ran wide. Martin hit him then and he almost fell off, which was quite crazy. Uh, very, very, very reminiscent of the sprint race. Really, the the opener to this race. It was almost like watching a continuation with all the the chaos in the first lap. But I think that kind of then was a foreshadowing of what happened later on because I think Marquez very similar thing going into turn three. So the locks the front, you know, the forks are bottomed out. He locks the front, has to release the brake, hits into the side of Martin because he's just going so fast. Uh, Martin also I think was moving a little to the inside. Not that I'm blaming Martin, of course, because he didn't do anything wrong. But I think that's why there was then a collision between those two. But, you know, with or without that, Marquez was always just careering straight into the back of Oliveira. And, yeah, it was unfortunate because he obviously wasn't trying to do an overtake, but it was quite reckless, similar to what his brother did to Jack Miller in uh, Phillip Island. Obviously, he's picked up a double on lap for that. Uh, He's also got a fracture to his first metacarpal. And uh, Jorge Martin has actually got a fractured toe as well, Um, whether it's from that incident or his incident later on. Not too sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was from the first one because his head, his, uh, his leg did get a, a hefty hit from Marquez. But yeah, I just it was a crazy move. I think probably a double long lap's about right. I perhaps maybe would have given him a back of the grid start, something like that. I know people were calling for race bands, and I think initially I actually called it as it, um, I said initially it was probably a borderline race band, but. Having looked at it again, you know, he, he's not going for a ridiculous move like I thought he was at first. He has just locked the front. So, yeah, maybe a double on lap or a back of the grid probably is a, is about right for Mark there. Yeah, I'm going to start off with Martin's fractured toe. I reckon it's from the Marcus in, in, or instant because where he crashes is the right-hander, double right-hander after Craig Jones. So you get down into the dip after Samsung Carney come up through the fast left-hander and... The whole time there, you're just kind of taking speed off, taking speed off. And it's one of those where you just tuck the front on a Chapoy Sogaro and you kind of just slide into the gravel. So for me, it's very unlikely he broke his toe on that. And also, trying to decipher some of MotoGP's tweets that he's broken his outside toe, or his number one toe as they call it. No, they could mean his inside toe, but it sounds like that he's broken an inside or an outside toe. 
I would have it a guess that it was the Marquez collision that caused that because it was such a brutal in, like impact around that area. It just it all points to me that it was the incident with Mark. Now, for me, when it happened, I didn't think race ban. Um, Marquez has done this for years where he's looked like he's coming in so hot, out of control, and for years he's gotten away with it, and today, unfortunately, he's bitten him now. Um, even though Rossi's not been at the front of this grid for years and years now Marcus is still the villain uh, even after all this because even though he, I know he took out the home favourite but he took out Harger Martin well, if, he, if he took out Harger Martin most of the crowd would have booed him anyway because there's still too much of a Rossi influence on this and I think the way Valentino stepped down and the VR46 crew kind of came in and kind of picked up the Italian flag side of it I think Anyone that was a Rossi fan is now either a Bastion, or not Bastion, Bagnaia, uh, Morbidelli, Marini, Bezecchi, they're, they're the kind of the supporters and spread among the VR46 crew. So if Marcus does something wrong, there's still a good 60, 70% of the crew that will be on his back for it. And he was being G'd and booed the whole way in. And I feel sorry for him because it's, it just proves that he's constantly on the limit. He's constantly overriding that bike and he's trying to make up all his time on the front end and for me this will not be like if we look at his whole weekend into the corner he crashed already trying to get a toe he had an instant in the sprint race there he had an instant on lap one there there's just he's so over limited into these tight little corners because he's trying to break so late I don't even I've watched it so many times on board I don't think he even makes a mistake I just think it's he's putting so much pressure on that bike that the bike locks he has to release the brake he has a bit of coll- uh, collision with Jorge Martin and at that point then he's just destined to collide with um, Miguel Oliveira and it's just really unfortunate because Miguel had a good sprint race made a small mistake that cost him a couple positions and he had a great start got into the lead for a corner and then maybe look like a podium man and it would be nice to see what he could have done if he was given the full race because it looks like a pretty is a bike that's good on his tire so you never know a home podium for miguel probably was on the cards in my opinion i reckon he had the pace over probably bezecchi maybe maybe would he have gotten vinales possibly he probably i don't know if he would have beaten him on pace but i probably think he would have probably bullied them into the posi- keeping that position as well I would have seen that but it, it's it's good that Mir or not Mir Miguel is somewhat fit he hasn't broken a leg or some vert doing his back it's just again lots of contusions from that impact which we all know at this point from this podcast this educational podcast that it is bruising so for me you never thought you'd learn something from us yeah exactly usually you use things when you watch or and listen to our podcast but today it's an educational one but for me double long lap is enough um, starting at the back of the grid isn't really a penalty in my eyes, um, not in modern day um, the opening lap Americas will make up a lot of positions to the point where it'll kind of not really do much the double long lap for me is a bit more of a penalty because it happens twice like for me starting at the back of the grid he's going to be brave into turn one and <laughs> like we've already seen him didn't he have a bad qualifying one year in argentina and he like made up 10 positions on that one i know different times and stuff like that but he he will be oh, good I on the, remember back to the last time he had a penalty at argentina oh christ yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> remember what happened to the grid that day yeah you can either wonder why uh Alex is calling for a race ban Alex doesn't want to have that again <laughs> yeah Poor guy, he's got absolutely sent. <laughs> to double line that penalty, I think, is just about enough. A race ban isn't right because it, it's people calling for an, an emotional decision more than setting it down. Since Rossi's retired, I'm, I'm pretty much um, not really swayed left or right by any one rider. I, I have the riders I like, but there's no rider that I am kind of bound to. So when riders make mistakes, I'm probably a bit more level-headed in calling out what really happened and what the penalty should be. So I think a race ban is probably a bit over the top really yeah well Oliveira is one of my favorite riders so it's pro- maybe that's why like i said when i first saw it that's what i said afterwards you know i, don't, I didn't think that it's just when at the start so that's borderline a race ban so i wasn't even actually saying definitely needed one but yeah a lot of people have been calling for that i think even a like you say was even calling for that so yeah it just was unfortunate for everybody involved Especially for Oliveira, of course, although it does seem like he's actually probably come off the best. It doesn't seem like he's got any fractures, whereas the other two have. But uh, yeah, being knocked out of a podium spot at your home race, that's, that'll hurt more than any fracture, I'm sure. 
uh, for uh, for Miguel because first race on an Aprilia as well. He looked really good, but at least hopefully he can take this forward into the next weekends. But speaking of Aprilia, Maverick Vinales, finally, finally, you know, remember the amount of podcasts last season where I was like, yeah, he'd be really good at this track. He'd be really good here, and he'd be like seventeenth or, or something. <laughs> Finally, he was there. He didn't quite win, obviously. He didn't quite win, but he, he was very good. He looked good all weekend, and yeah, he, he was. He kept Pecco honest, and nobody else was keeping Pecco honest throughout that race. So fantastic from Vinales, fast from the outset, which is not the Vinales style. Usually, he takes a while to build into the race. Now, I think Marquez playing bowling did help him. I think he obviously picked up a few positions from that, but uh, even still, he then immediately closed that massive gap that it sort of allowed Pecco to have and then just stuck to his back wheel for a while. So with, with Vinales, I was very impressed by him because to be honest, he didn't have his normal testing form, I didn't think. He didn't really seem to be topping every test session. I was a little bit worried about that, but maybe he's finally realised that you get the, get the points on the race weekends. For for me, I still just had in the back of my head, is like I don't see him passing him. I just don't see where he can actually make the overtake because... He got into P2. He closed straight onto the back of him, which I pretty much expected straight away. I I rate Vinales' pace when he has clear track is probably the best on the field. Maybe Marquez, a fit Marquez on a good Honda. Maverick Vinales is out of this world when he needs and wants to be. It's, it's quite frightening, his pace, when he actually brings it together. But when he closed into the back of the Ducati, got into about six tenths, seven tenths behind him. There was about a few laps to go by. The gap slowly increases. And the commentary are kind of going, yeah, this is what we expect by Ignite to pull the bomb. And I was thinking, mm, is this? Maverick is always known for like keeping the tyre, having light, light load on the wheels and keeping everything looking smooth and bringing the bike to the end of the race to fight. And it turns out it goes up to about 1.4, I believe, was the highest. Then it comes back down, down under a second. And then with a couple of laps to go, it's 0.6 again. Now, again, he never gets close enough to go for an overtake. And one of my big questions is where could he have overtaken him? I don't think... I feel with Maverick, he needs to have a serious overspeed uh, advantage to be able to pass someone. And I don't think you'll ever get that on the Ducati. So it'll be interesting to see, can they actually build upon this? Because the... Yeah, you're two good Aprilias and two Aprilias that were a bit wanting a bit more. So, for me, Maverick, brilliant start, looking very fast. And I really hope he builds on it. And we go to Argentina where he's won before. So, who knows? Yeah, I think he looked one lap, I think, into turn one. He had a bit of a run. I think his mm. came off the peg a bit um, as, as he went for it. But that was the closest thing he ever came. And I think he seriously thought about that. I think then, I think that might have been the lap where Banyaya put a bit more of a better lap together. I think it just stopped him. But there was one lap where he sort of let, pulled alongside going to turn one. And uh, he, he wasn't able to pull the pass. But I thought he was maybe going to try after that. But it seemed like that was his closest opportunity. But yeah, you do quickly mention there the uh, those two Aprilias that were a bit disappointed. I was quite disappointed with Ralph Fernandez actually. Uh, this weekend, I expected a bit more. And Aleish as well. But Aleish, his, his sprint race wasn't too bad. It was just... His main race, he got uh, caught up battling Zarco, so I think that's what happened to him, mainly. We may as well talk about Pekka again. Obviously, we spoke about him earlier, so probably just keep it fairly brief, but uh, like we said, just perfect race for him. He pulled out the gap from Vinales when he needed to. He let, Vinales got pretty close right at the end. It would have been interesting to see if there'd been a couple more laps, but I, I just think Banya is just so difficult to pass. I just think he pretty much put himself in the, the driving seat that was once he got the lead. Like once he overtook Oliveira, I just don't think there was ever really anybody getting back in front unless they were a Ducati. And well, Marquez cleared out the the uh, the only Ducati that was there. For me, Pecco has a bit of arrogance this year about him. I think he has so much more self belief. I do agree with you. You did say he has an error in him still, and I do think he has a Magello in him where he crashed a couple of years ago. The Le Mans incident where he's looking at the big screen and he crashes. He does have that kind of chink in his armor still now it's lesser and lesser every race that goes by i believe that it gets less and less of an issue and he becomes more complete but i think he just had it covered i think it's like the um the Moto two race with Acosta. i think he just had it covered i think he had pace in hand the bike was good i don't think there's any issue with tire wear 
it, he was just looked great. Did you see the tire in part of Fermi? Yeah, it just it briefly. It looked on. It didn't look new, but it looked in very good condition. Yeah, it looked like it had it had been well treated for that race. So, like we were bigging up a Aprilia and Maverick here, saying that like brilliant job. They kind of put him under pressure. He held him, held a kind of flamed him for most of the race. But then you see a pretty pretty new tire in Park Fermi, and then you think to yourself. That bike really hasn't really been pushed, it has it? So you wonder how good is Peko. I remember I criticised Fabio Quadraro, who will come to in a second, in a lot of podcasts last year at the start of the season, that I was kind of, his season before that, that he won, and I was kind of like, well, he, he's good, like, but he has a mistake, and he's not always there, and he's not consistent enough, and there's too many issues. He had the uh, the arm pump and the letters coming up in the Catalonia, there's too many issues. And then the second season, as he defended his title, he put that Yaman in place as that, my goodness, I could not believe the overtakes he's doing. And I reckon we're getting early signs of what Peko is going to be like as a champion. I reckon he could be very similar where he's going to pull out these stunning performances, and no one could have touched him today. Even if Martin is there, I don't see him getting back past. Oh, yeah, I just... I probably think Maverick catches the back of uh, Harga Martini probably gets stuck there as well because he can't overtake as well as everyone else and I think Peko sails off into the sunset I think I don't think there's anyone today that could have really put a glove to him and I think the the sprint race was probably the only chance he had to beat him but uh, yeah he's been impeccable all weekend in fairness to him so hats off to him 37 points uh, it's going to be a long season for everyone else yeah, I think so. I think uh, it's not going to be the first time we see him pick up 37, let's put it that way. Uh, I think we're going to see that a fair few times throughout the season. But like you said, we are going to move on to Fabio Quattararo now. And just a miserable weekend, a, a track where it shouldn't have been. Uh, obviously, Quattararo, if you take away the second Portimao race in uh, 2021, he won the last two races. He's won the last two Portuguese Grand Prix there. And Really, he struggled in qualifying. Was he about eleventh on the grid? Yeah, I believe I read that he had a an issue with the sort of the start the start procedure, the start like the launch device in the sprint race. So that was why he had a bad start. Then, obviously, we already mentioned before, Mir decided to uh, ride on the inside curb and set his airbag off. Uh, so obviously, the sprint race was pretty much gone for him. He didn't score anything in the sprint race because obviously only the top nine score in that. And then in the, the main race, he just, again, he seemed to get beat up off the start. He said he took the wrong line, so he must have picked the wrong line into turn one. Uh, he did sort of slowly carve his way back through, and by the end, he'd caught up to that dice for fifth place, but it was too little too late. Uh, and I think, don't think he really would have been able to carve his way through. He perhaps would have been able to pass a couple of them. Obviously, he did get in front of the Leish because the Leish ran wide, but I think he just struggled to overtake all those riders, especially with them being... Uh, Brad Binder and Jack Miller, they're not exactly bad on the brakes, are they? So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would have uh, would have been tough to actually get any higher up than that. So, and with Banyai picking up the perfect number of points at a track where Quattararo probably targeted that. And, um, yeah, it's just, it seems to be very reminiscent of the start of last season, but even worse because a track where he should be performing. Yeah, we're also not seeing the, the kind of stuttering misfire from Peko at the start of the season so like we saw last year Fabio really doing brilliant at the start of the season after an opening rocky season and Peko being so far off that when we came to Aston we were all kind of like yeah this is over Peko is out of it Fabio is going to walk the rest of us I reckon we could see the opposite of that this year I think we could see Peko now his teammates out of the picture Marcus clearly doesn't have the equipment Fabio clearly doesn't have the equipment Jorge Martinez, too many mistakes in him still. There's too many there's too many riders that I have a reason why they can't get close to him. And if Peko goes on a run, we could be going to Saxon Ring or Spielberg and he could have like 100 odd points over anyone. So it could be one of the most dominating uh, seasons we'll ever see. But Yam have made a step, but it's the same old story. Um, you can have the fastest bike in the world if you put it behind a lorry and you can't overtake it can't really do much can you so at the moment the lorry is the v4s uh, fabio can't get past them the lack of data from a satellite team back to the factory team is probably going to only slow them down more and really is he going to be able to qualify well enough to get any results i don't know for me i was just thinking while you were you were kind of entering the quarter hour piece there that 
quarter hours weekend is make make or break of a Saturday morning now. Um, you have two free practices Monday or Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and then you get the practice thirty minutes practice in the morning, and then you go straight into qualifying, and that could be where his weekend is over because not only do you not get positions for you don't move up positions for your grid if you do well in the sprint, but if he qualifies eight, nine, tenth every week, he's not going to score points in the sprint, and he'll probably score six points a week in the rain race, he'd be out of the top ten in the championship at that rate. He has to, like, I already know that he's risking it all, but he has to find something on one lap pace, whether it's somehow get a toe, even though I was going to get a toe if that doesn't work either. There has to be a solution. Um, I'm not too sure yet. I, the toe just doesn't work with the Yamaha. Yeah. You've got a Ducati then in your way in the corners. I think that's the, the problem. Yeah, but even even with all the empty track and all the corner speed, it still doesn't seem that they can do the one lap, which is just frightening because if they, if they can't even like seemingly do it on their own, how are they meant to do it when they're around the other bike? So they're just you feel sorry for Quarter. And at this moment in time, if we get to Heret and he still hasn't had a good result, if he has a poor Texas, poor Argentina, doesn't go well at Argentina, which is to be noted, he does not like that track, and. <laughs> I could see his head being turned by another team. Now, you might ask where. I don't know. But I think Fabio is rated as one of the top three, top two riders on the grid at the moment. So I don't think there will be a surplus of issues with coming to offers if people really genuinely thought they could get him. Um, yeah, I feel sorry for him really deep down. He is uh, He's one of the riders I'd probably lean towards. I do like Fabio. Uh, after a season last year, how he performed so well against the adversity of the Ducatis. But um, there's only in modern day MotoGP, there's only so much a rider can do. And unfortunately, Yamaha have. It, I, I kind of look at Yamaha as I look at Mercedes and Formula One. They've probably hit all their targets, but maybe their targets are too low because it looks like they've gained the extra mile an hour or two miles an hour at the end of the straight. They're back to last year's chassis with Fabio, so clearly the new chassis wasn't any better. So they have a slightly different engine, really, this year. That's it. Um, so really, is that, is that going to change it? No, because the new aero they brought doesn't work because the aero that gives them higher top speed it doesn't work everywhere else. So they've gone back to last year's aero, which is a bit more draggy, which means the engine's getting overworked for what it's able to keep up with. So it's just it's just one step forward, two back with Yamaha, and unfortunately, quarter hours is in the spiral of... Every week it's the same thing, and I, I I only see it getting worse. Unless he can somehow figure out how to mastermind the one lap, which he was so good at for one point. Yeah, I just yeah. I mean, I think you make a good point there that we're saying that oh yeah, Fabio can't do the one lap, but well, they're not being able to do the one lap. But it's not Fabio; it, he's one of the best qualifiers in the grid. Uh, it, it's the fact that the bike can't do it. So yeah, I it's going to be difficult for him to turn it then around and I think you're right I think if it continues he probably will get his head turned honestly I think he could be a good fit uh, to Prilia you know so obviously Aleish is not going to be around forever he's going to be retiring at some point he's you know the oldest right on the grid maybe this is his last year in MotoGP especially you know he's seen Ball this shame. It, it could be I'm not saying that you know he's going to get kicked out I'm going to say it's going to be on his own terms yeah yeah you know, but you know you know my point is perspective obviously he's got a young family you know Maybe he peaked last year. You know that perhaps was his best season in MotoGP. You know, if you judge it off this weekend. You know, he's got Vinales, Oliveira, the riders on the Aprilia to contend with. Now that seems to be able to get more out of it, which is the first time that's ever happened to him on the Aprilia. So, yeah, I uh, know it's a bold claim. It's just a potential thing I was thinking because I don't see any room at Ducati for him because hmm. uh, I can't really see him going to a satellite team. So, I think the only way he goes to Ducati is if he gets in at Pramac, really. Which again is going to be one of those things where you know, does he want to go to a satellite team? Because can you win a championship on a satellite team? You, know, you could argue maybe not. So yeah, but uh, that's kind of out of scope for this podcast anyway. Making up fantasy uh, transfers <laughs> for Fabio Quattararo for uh, 2024 and beyond. So uh, I think we've probably had enough of your time because I think we're going to like over an hour to uh, this week. So thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed the podcast, if you are listening on YouTube do give the video a like. And if you are listening on uh, Spotify, if you could rate the podcast five stars, if you enjoyed it, really, really would appreciate it. It was, it would help us out quite a lot, but I hope you have enjoyed the podcast. We'll see you next week in Argentina. Well, we're not going to be in Argentina, but to talk about the Argentinian GP. So we'll see you there. <laughs>